happy 2022. This is the fifth conversation in our new work series, Insolvable's new work series on regeneration. We are happy to see so many um, familiar faces and being part of this conversation to kick off the, the new year. My name is Adam Lerner and I am the founder of Solvable. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Mae Bartlett, who will be facilitating this conversation. Also, our, our colleague, Charles Holmes, is also here from Solvable as part of the conversation as well. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge that I'm on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth nations, otherwise known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I'm an uninvited visitor to these lands and do my best to be a custodian and steward of, of where I live. Um, to set a little bit of context for, for this conversation that we're having today around regenerative cities, I, I want to kind of, I've been thinking about this relationship that we, in doing all of these conversations around regeneration and how this is a particularly unique one in the sense that uh, oftentimes these conversations are really centered around agency and who has agency in order to make the kind of change that we want to see in the world. And it strikes me that this conversation around cities is a really unique one because uh, as we look to transition our economies and communities from ones of extraction to ones of regeneration, perhaps there's no other topic that is as unifying as, as the conversation around cities. Cities really are platforms for change and impact uh, with over half the world living in cities currently. And that number is expected to double, which is kind of horrifying, um, by 2050 in living in cities. Um, and also with over 80% of GDP generated from within cities, engaging with cities as both geospatial and cognitive spaces for regeneration are essential to staying within our planetary boundaries. But cities also offer everyone regenerative roles, and that doesn't matter whether it's from a community context or from a, a professional context, we all have roles to play in this. Um, and I see that people are starting to say uh, where they're coming, calling in from, and please feel free to share where you're calling in from, uh, what's showing up for you, um, any of your own land acknowledgements. So thank you for doing that. These conversations in the series that uh, Solvable has put together is, is really an honored space for us to be able to hold with uh, so many practitioners and leaders uh, such as Dominique who are contributing their voices into a more regenerative future. We are doing this as a, a, as a knowledge commons. We don't charge for these events. We all pour lots of time into creating them. And in, in, in exchange, we ask that you, everyone that's here kind of shows up does show up fully, is here to participate and, uh, and contribute in shifting the perspectives of others. So these are intended to be generative conversations, and we will be in multiple breakout groups today, in which we hope that you enjoy. It's intended to be active and participatory. I do want to just mention briefly the, the idea of that the Presencing Institute has refined around what, it, what, in, what is uh, a generative conversation in our four modes of listening. We want to um, think about the, four, the third and fourth levels the Presen Presencing Institute talks about, which is to be able to see through the eyes of others and to be able to connect with new possibilities. It's, a, it's our hope that you find these spaces both in the conversations that we'll be sharing that May and I will be facilitating with, uh, with Dominique, but also in, in all of your breakout groups. I'd like to begin by uh, visualization. And uh, given that we're all in multiple Zoom meetings and it's often very hard to reconnect back to our bodies in place and, and space and time, that we're gonna take a couple of minutes at the beginning now to, uh, to center and bring our full attention to this conversation. So I invite everyone to close your eyes or, or cast off a soft gaze. Adjust your body so that you feel comfortable and relaxed wherever you're sitting. Now take five deep breaths in, focusing on the movement of your breath in and out. Now that you're beginning to sense into your body, I'd like to invite you to think about a time where you felt fully immersed inside of a city. 
It could be while you were traveling or in the place that you live. It could be in an event or a festival, a marketplace, a professional engagement, perhaps a meal, a walk, or somewhere else where you felt vitality surrounding you and your body. What are you part of? What are you seeing around you? How does your body feel in this space? Now I invite you to tune into the sounds around you. What do you hear? In order to tune in a bit deeper, let's try and separate the audio tracks. Let's first concentrate on the human-centered sounds around you. What voices do you hear? What do the machines around you sound like? How are buildings creating sound and reverberating what is around? What else do you hear? Now I invite you to switch audio tracks and focus on non-human sounds. What do you hear in that place in the city? What kind of sounds are being created by the weather? How about the sounds created by other life? Is this hard to hear? Are easy to access. Now I invite you to see if you can integrate those two audio tracks back together, the human in the more than human world. Is it a symphony, a cacophony? What stands out and is overtaken? How does your body feel as you listen? As you feel into your body, I invite you to return to where you currently are. What do you hear around you? Are any of those sounds still present? What is missing? When you're ready, I invite you to slowly open your eyes and return to this place in this moment. Thank you everybody for going on that visual journey with us. Before we begin our conversation with Dominique Hess, uh, we're gonna take five minutes for a quick breakout group. This will give you the chance to briefly connect with others who you will later return to in this conversation. Uh, when you start, please introduce yourself and share either something that came up for you in the visualization or why the topic of regenerative cities interested you enough to be here today. This once again will be a very quick conversation, uh, five minutes, so just keep each of your intros brief and then you'll get a chance to come back together later on in the session. Hello. Okay, well now it is my honor to introduce our guest today. With degrees in science engineering and PhD in architecture, Dr. Dominique Hess brings a multidisciplinary perspective to the question, can we move beyond sustainability to urban abundance and thriving? Dominique is currently the zero carbon buildings lead for the city of Melbourne, chair of the board of Green Fleet and an adjunct fellow in the city's research institute at Griffith University. Her continued research centers on how to create a built environment that is good for people and the nature they are a part of. Incorporating knowledge from biomimicry, biophilia, regenerative design, permaculture, and positive development. Dominique is the author and editor of six books and over 100 papers and reports. Welcome, Dominique. It's a pleasure to be here with you. 
Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation and being part of this great lineup you've had of speakers. Of course. So um, I'm, I'm calling from uh, the lands of the Boonarong, uh, and I work on the lands of the uh, Boonarong, the Boiwurrung and the Wurundjeri. Uh, and uh, I live in an area that is, uh, there's a river uh, to the north of me, to the northeast, and the bay to the south, and so surrounded by water, which is where I'm happy. Uh, my family actually come from Northern Europe, so we were the farmers and the fishers for the last few centuries, um, and uh, I feel a real affinity with, with the land. Um, and so I'd like to pay respects to elders past and present and emerging and those present with us today. Uh, and I'm really grateful to be living in Australia and being able to learn from the longest continuing living culture of this planet, um, but also to be able to listen and learn from nature. Um, those are sort of parts of my passions. Um, and very thankful to be here with you all this morning, or this evening for you guys. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful sunny day here. I understand it's snowing uh, where you are, Adam. <laughs> Um, but uh, but also beautiful in its own way. Yeah, I love all of the different seasons that we're bringing into this call. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'd love to start our conversation just by asking you, what role do you see cities playing in creating a regenerative future? So I was thinking about this question and I started with why, why do we have cities? Why, 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 why do we congregate as as humans um, in in places? Uh, and I, and I think you know historically it would have been for safety. Uh, it would have been um, uh, bringing together of economies of scale uh, and being able to 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 build relationships. Uh, and so I felt cities are probably kind of the acupuncture points of, of human creativity, innovation, um, capacity building. Uh, and so that, that got me a little bit excited because um, acupuncture points in, in sort of Chinese medicine uh, are, are places where, or in Eastern medicine are places where you can unlock a lot of potential. Uh, and so when, in, in thinking about the roles of cities, I think they're, they're places of great potential because they bring so many aspects together. Uh, as as um, Adam said earlier, they're, they're places of great energy use and, 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 and economic viability and, and a whole lot of other activity. And then I was thinking of it in, in relation to how things have shifted in the last three years, um, pre-pandemic, in the pandemic at the moment and what it could look like in post pandemic and what have we learned through this period and, and uh, as cities and this potential of cities. And I think what we've all learned is that at home, we like doing our kind of transactional work, our um, uh, the menial things where we just want some quiet time and we just want to get those figures down and we just want to do that bit of reading. Um, we want to write that report. But what we really missed is coming together and, and those generative conversations, uh, that, that opportunity to co-create, to relate together, to, to feel each other's energy, to, to walk through the cities and, and um, see where things are. And so I think there, there is, is some great potential in that when we're talking about what does a regenerative city look like in the future is, is to acknowledge cities as these acupuncture nodes of human potential um, and that what we really want from our cities is that relational aspect of coming together and co-creating and, and building ideas and building potential. And then um, and I, I knew this question was coming and then Adam threw me with this, this audio um, experience and it reminded me of one of, one of the reasons that Adam um, and yourself may ask me to speak is because I, I kind of, I don't want to just talk about these things. It's very easy to be motherhood about creating vitality and viability and the potential to co-create together, which is, you know, what regenerative development does. But what does it really mean in practice? And, and the audio kind of experience reminded me of a project that we did called the, uh, the Living Pavilion. Um, and um, the Living Pavilion was a six-week 
placemaking um, type intervention at the University of Melbourne, um, co-led uh, by a number of wonderful academics and practitioners. And um, we took a space that was rather underutilised and we filled it with uh, 40,000 Kulin Nation plants um, and event spaces and curated it with lots of uh, music and dance and activities and learning and things for children and, and so forth. And then there was an Indigenous garden uh, and there were so many aspects of it, but there was also a soundscape that was designed, that was created for that space. And that, that soundscape mirrored the Indigenous calendar. And I was taking a colleague through the space and I was, I, I loved this space so much for the six weeks that it existed. And we arrived and I was like, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't, why doesn't it feel right? And it was just ticked over to nine o'clock and it must have been on automatic and the soundscape came on. And suddenly it was like, ah, okay. That's, that's what was missing, the, the, the sound of nature, the, the, the connection to the environment. And so I think as much as our cities are about this, this node of, of potential, of co-creation of the social aspects, I think nature has an integral role in that as well. And so bringing nature into our cities uh, as a partner in that co-creation, I think is also important. Absolutely. I love that example. And I love just all of the senses that you intentionally uh, tapped into in that six week project. I also love this image of um, cities being the actu acupuncture points um, and places of possibility in our larger earth body. I just can I feel a lot of power there. Um, and it, it makes me wonder, you know, thinking about the specific cities, and I know they're each unique, and even the way that you've designed that project, you know, having a soundscape that is particular to that place and the land. And, you know, how would you, if you were to kind of narrow in on just, just a city and the different cities around the world, how would you define a regenerative city? What needs to go into it to make it regenerative? So every, every place is unique. And, and so I think it's, it's starting from that understanding that, uh, you know, Melbourne's different to New York is different to Helsinki. Um, is, is different to a small, um, intimate place. Um, I grew up in a, a small town called Gressford, very different. Uh, so each, each place is unique and starting from that uniqueness. In, in preparing for this, uh, I thought I would reach out through my LinkedIn network to all of the regenerative, other regenerative practitioners out there because one of the things with regenerative development and one of the things with really understanding um, that what we're shifting into is an ecological worldview, a, 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 an idea of co-creation, interrelatedness, inter, uh, interdependence, is that there is no hero, there is no person that has the right answer. Um, and that was one of the contributions that Jenny Anderson gave in, in that LinkedIn call for what do you think a regenerative city looks like? Uh, so I thought I, I would practice that intent of I'm not the expert, the experts actually the field out there of people working in the space thinking about this. And one of the people that responded is the amazing Bill Reed from Regenesis. And always challenging, always, always taking my thinking to that next level. Um, he actually said, um, there are two aspects, you know, I, I was I was dumbing things down by because I asked people, what are the two things that you think would make a regenerative city? And, he's, and he challenged me with, firstly, um, who do we need to become to work with life and life systems in the city? So who do we need to become? And that's the first part of uh, that he says is, is a very generative part of the conversation. Who do we need to step up to be of service to this place um, from a living systems perspective? But he said, that's just the, the generative side of things. That's not yet regenerative. And he said, the regenerative part of it is um, that that becoming is a practice, a continual practice of renewal, of being present, of listening, of feedback and so forth. And that, that is very much um, the uniqueness, I guess, that we as a human species can bring to the potential of this earth. Uh, it's that... Um, nature is continually generating, uh, is continually 
uh, evolving. Um, but we as humans can actually consciously participate within that process, be part of that process of generation. Um, and uh, through our creativity and in, in intuition and innovation, um, actually bring that consciousness, that understanding. We, we can have a planetary understanding now, which we could never have before. And so we're now really in that potential to bring it right back to the first question of the potential of our cities now post pandemic, is that potential to know that whole of system, whole of worldview and, and bring that in our capacity as innovators and creators and um, intuition and testers and so forth and reflection. Um, and so thank you, Bill Reid, for, for bringing that, um, that idea. Uh, I also thought I'd briefly riff off um, in, in the first becoming part of it, becoming um, working with life and life systems. And that reminded me of Janine Benyus and, and her work in biomimicry and, and life's principles. Um, there are many practitioners and, and those ideas as well were co-created from a whole lot of knowledge that Janine brought together, Indigenous conversations and so forth. So what, what are the life systems that we need to become with? Uh, and so for me, the most important is the idea of nestedness. And this came through from my LinkedIn survey of practitioners as well. Thank you, Jenny, again. Um, that idea of nestedness, um, that I, idea of um, being into interrelated, so everything is relational. How I feel and how, how I turn up affects how you feel and how you turn up and how you are here. And the smiles and nods I'm getting from the screen up there, uh, that is all part of that, how, how I am able to turn up here today. Um, that we're interdependent. Um, and, and so th those are the things that are really playing for me as we talk about what, what is a regenerative system um, that we all are part of the system and how we turn up within the system will affect um, the potential we can reach together. So, um, but again, all of that sounds very motherhood and um, Adam invited me here to tell you some practical stories. So I wanted to tell you two stories. Um, the first one's a small scale, small community development called The Paddock, and the, the other one's a $2 billion project uh, for the University of Melbourne. So small scale, big scale. Um, and The Paddock story is, um, The Paddock is a development in Castle, Maine, which is about an hour and a half uh, west of Melbourne. Um, it's in an area that is uh, fairly dry. Uh, was very decimated through the gold mining. Um, they basically stripped the land of the trees, the topsoil, and then changed the water courses. Uh, and, the, and the owners, um, the current uh, people that uh, look after the land, um, started restoring the land, started planting trees, started just observing the land and working with the land. And um, about six years ago, decided to uh, create a, a development there that was a, a juxtaposition to all of the other developments that were happening, which were very cookie cutter, houses as big as the block, um, very little nature, scrape the earth clean again and, and plonk down all of these houses. They, they wanted something to be an alternative to that. And they created this concept of the paddock with um, architect, uh, Grosby Architects. And um, Within that, the first thing we did was we worked with citizen science and we did three lots of research looking at, well, what is the soil like? What is the water like? What are the, the birds in the area? What are the trees in the area? What are the um, microorganisms um, and so forth? Uh, and we looked at uh, what, how can we design a development that uh, is as good for nature as it is for people? And then, you know, because I'm a researcher and a scientist and, and, I, and I'm interested in actually knowing whether we've succeeded, how do we measure success? And we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can bring back some species. So we designed to bring back the powerful owl. I feel almost hamstrung that I can't use PowerPoint and share you these beautiful images in PowerPoint. And the sugar glider. And the golden sun moth. And the growling grass frog. And this little guy, 
just to show that we don't just go for the cute species. The legless lizard. So those are our apex species. If these species come back, that means the water is okay, there's enough insects, the soil's okay, there's enough um, microorganisms in there for the worms to eat and then the, the lizard to eat and then the frog to eat and then the owl to eat the frog and the lizard and so forth. So all of these things, can we design a development for people at the same density as the other developments, but that is also bringing back these guys. Now we're halfway through building that development and I've got to say COVID's had a huge impact in our capacity to meet the living building challenge, which is what we designed the buildings to. But um, half of the people are in and I can say that this guy's been spotted. This guy's been spotted and this guy's been heard <laughs> to the point they were complaining about how loud the frog noises were. How cool is that? <laughs> um, and we didn't design for this guy, but this guy came back too. A little. Um, plus we've created these wonderful houses um, and these homes are um, designed to be low toxic, um, lots of fresh air, beautiful views, um, gardens. Um, there's a community house. And um, within that uh, um, process, within, and again, I wish I had a PowerPoint to show you this, but there are five views into the development and each development, each view is a celebration of a different period of time. So we're connecting to the time of the place as well as the ecology of the place and the social capacity of the place. So there's a gold rush view in, there's an indigenous view in, there's a um, farmer, view in um, there is the current currently it's kind of an academic quirky community uh, with like foodies and, and, and breweries and wine and, and cheese and all of that so there's a view that celebrates that and then there's a view to the future now that's the intention but we have um, the, the the community that lives there it's up to them how they curate those spaces and, and what they have in that so they have the ownership and the agency to do that now I was there the other day um, just having a poke around taking photos as I do periodically. And um, uh, they also have invited in a expert on grasses and plants and they've created for themselves a little chart of these are the good plants we want to nurture and these are the plants we are weeds that we want to manage. Uh, and so they have themselves through their own initiatives created a process of um, understanding how to care for the country that they're in. Um, they call me up and send me photos when things pop in. Um, so they are continuing the citizen science journey. So they have agency over this place. And also while we were sitting around the fire there, while I was there, they, they talked about how important this place had been through COVID. So it's, it's, a, it's been a very uh, nurturing place for them to be together, to feel part of a community, to feel connected. And so um, that's my small scale story. Um, and um, my large scale story is just very brief. Um, it's, it's, I have a lot fewer, I have no pretty pictures to show you. Uh, about uh, eight years ago, this, uh, the University of Melbourne, where I was working, was redeveloping a whole section of the university. It was a $2 billion commitment, seven buildings. And they asked us to work with them to understand how they could get across 10 years from where they are now, where they're still net impacting, they're efficient, but still net impacting to a point where they're um, to zero to the point where they're regenerative. Um, and we worked with them. Actually, I do have an artifact I can show you. And we developed a lenses, a lenses artifact for the project, which outlined the principles of the project, the flows that brought the place to life and the intention to, um, to, to shift from that negative to that regenerative um, perspective. Um, but the one thing that I want to share with that um, is, is that these are the sorts of things that you will come across a lot where, where big organisations are on this journey. But the real potential of this project was that one of the opportunities that everybody working on the projects, the builders, the electricians, the, the designers, um, the building managers, um, the students, um, would go through a half day regenerative development training process, which then uh, helped them to conceptualize the potential of uh, going beyond zero, the potential of being net contributors to place, to actually heal space. 
and not just the people working, but anyone tendering for the work. Um, and in that way, this this potential development, given that there was two billion dollars on the on the on the table, was really interesting to to all consultants and all engineers and all architects. Meant that it had the potential to ripple throughout the community of Melbourne. Everybody um, that wanted to tender for the work would then participate in a half day workshop, would get trained up in the concepts of regenerative development, and could then build that into in their own way their practice and their contributions to the tender process. So that's the two stories I wanted to share. Oh, thank you for both of those. And there's so much there that I wish we could dive deeper into. I mean, some of the themes that are standing out for me are, you know, this idea that a regenerative city is not a fixed state. You know, it's not something we were, are working toward and then we accomplish it. It's a way of being and becoming, and it's something that we're always in relationship with. And it's about how we're showing up and our worldview and mindset, um, you know, how we're viewing ourselves in relationship to place and all of other life on earth. Um, so we're going to send you into breakouts again, and you're going to have a chance to talk about uh, one of these ideas uh, with each other. So our prompt for you kind of along this theme of being in service to place and benefiting nature and other life forms just beyond humans the prompt that we have for you is how can you be and how are you of service to place? So you'll have about 15 minutes um, and you know, use the, the time as you see fit and then we'll see you all back here. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had great conversations in your breakouts. We would actually um, like to create some space for you to share back some of what you discussed, but we're going to come back to that in about 15 minutes. So if you, there's anything you want to share directly from your conversation and you're worried that you might lose it, feel free to share that in the chat. Otherwise, in about um, 15 minutes, we'll turn, turn the room open for everyone to share um, both questions as well as uh, things that were resonating from your conversations. So um, I'm gonna leave this section of the conversation with Dominique and picking back up where we uh, left, where you left off with May, I, I do, one of the things that we wanted to talk about and that you've written extensively about is the kind of worldview or the ecological worldview uh, that is a, pre, a kind of precondition, it seems like for moving to a more regenerative uh, way of approaching cities and living in cities and designing cities. I wonder if you could just um, share a little bit of your perspective about what is this mind shift, mindset shift and worldview um, that, of the ecological that you think is, uh, is, is imperative as we look towards uh, regenerative cities? So, so part of the, the work is, you know, how have we, why are we in the situation we're in and, and what are we changing to? Um, and in, in looking backwards in, in why we've arrived at where we've arrived with all of the problems that we're in um, is uh, an understanding of, of the conditions that have led to the creation of the problems. Um, and, and partly that is the worldview. So the way that we see the world, uh, the glasses we have on when we're interacting with the world affects how we behave within the world. Uh, and uh, for the last Five, 2,000 to 500 years, depending on who you read, uh, people have been very reductionist in their way of thinking. They've been breaking things down. They've been very linear in their thinking. We can just see that with, with climate change and the issues with carbon dioxide and the atmosphere, right? It's, it's seen as a linear problem where, you know, carbon's an essential part of life. It isn't bad. It is just the way that we're using it is, is, is um, very linear. Um, and so that's called the mechanistic worldview, and that has led to many of the issues that we're seeing now. But you see that throughout human development. We have a way of thinking, and then as, as we get into that way of thinking, we start seeing the limitations of that thinking, which then leads to a new set of glasses, um, a better set of glasses that help you to focus better um, to move forward. Uh, and so many of us argue that we're shifting from that me mechanistic worldview, that rational imperialist way of looking at we can understand everything, we can control everything to a more ecological living systems worldview. Now, in saying that, it's not a linear process either. It's not like you leave the, mecha the mechanistic behind and you move towards the ecological. No, the mechanistic forms a part of the ecological worldview, a useful part. It's not a, a dichotomy. It's not an either or. Um, and um, that ecological worldview in many parts is learning 
again, because it's not linear, learning from our Indigenous elders and their ways of understanding um, country and land and, and the ways to live. Um, and within that ecological worldview, it, it brings in those living principles that Bill Reid challenged us with, which is, you know, that idea of we're nested, we're interrelated, uh, we're integrated, um, we, um, we are part of a living system where how we turn up affects how everything else uh, is able to be um, uh, turn up. Um, and so often that still confuses people when I say, you know, shifting from the, the linear to the, mechanis uh, the mechanistic to the ecological. Um, and, and some of my colleagues that are online today with us know that, that I often use the, that saying um, and it's gendered um, because of where it's come from, but I'll de-genderify it uh, as I move forward, but um, give a man a fish. So if people know that saying, right? Uh, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day or give a person a fish and they'll eat for a day. Um, that's very disempowering. You know, they are completely beholden to you. Teach them to fish, empowering but empowering within a very limited linear context is just about fishing. And if, if uh, within that context you value more fish, um, then you just keep taking the fish until, hey, you run out. Um, and so that's the mechanistic worldview. Uh, what we're shifting towards is um, teach the person to love the ocean. It's not saying don't fish. It's not saying, um, it's saying uh, approach this system with a sense of love and understanding and connection um, and, and from that make your decisions on how to best turn up to participate relate to um, this this system so it's from give a man a fish to teach him to a fish to teach him to love the ocean so I'm curious to dive into this a little bit more in the kind of practical um, sense because we we often speak in our work absolutely about the ecological world worldview and try to embrace it. From a, from a role standpoint, um, I'm curious, how do you see this manifesting changes in practice for those that are designing cities or parts of cities, whether they're buildings, urban planners, people that are working in government, how do you see the ecological worldview changing, shifting practice is the first part of the question. And then the second part, which is where I'd like to suspend some time is how do you see for those of us that think of our roles more as citizens within a community, um, a civic participation, how does the ecological world you change our roles as communal participants? So within, within practice, um, it is um, the understanding that the, the building that you build, the, the street that you design, um, the dam that you plan for, uh, the park that you uh, uh, are de developing, um, that these are all potentials to surface uh, what is happening in that community. So it isn't the artifact is the outcome, the, the regenerative process, the ecological uh, worldview process is how can what I am designing the artifact that's coming from this be of service to this place, um, and that that can can from from the from the macro you know what's the form of the building how will it sit on the site to the how does the junior architect that's going to be doing the documentation for this the most boring part the no documentation for this how can they feel empowered and grow by their participation within this building, this project. So it's that thinking of um, how does everyone that participate in this project uh, become better, stronger, uh, more uh, connected to what we're creating here. And very challenging to, to us practitioners is, is that you never leave a project behind. It's never something you do and then you move on to the next one. It is always something where a part of yourself becomes part of that project. Just like the paddock, I'm just so proud to go and visit that every time, even though I have had no involvement really in it in the last three years. Um, it's And I continue to answer questions and I continue to be part of that. It is part of who I am. And it's 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 that relational way as opposed to that transactional way of, of participating within your capacity in the city. And to go to the second part, which is the citizen um, part of it, our citizens are an integral part of the system um, and they can be sidelined or they can be brought in. Um, and uh, often they are wiser. They have such intelligence and wisdom about their place 
Uh, and so having that, uh, as you said, from the Presencing Institute, that uh, that sense of listening uh, to everybody, everyone in the place, including nature, with the intent to learn, I think, is, is how we bring those citizens in. And it's not easy. Um, we have sidelined our citizens for a long time. They've been easier to manage in that box over there where they have no power. But that has that's part of that mechanistic worldview where if we don't understand something, we just kind of try and manage it away. Uh, here we're inviting them in to be a part of this journey um, to, to bring, to give them agency, um, which has within our current system a lot of challenges. It takes more time. It means that you have to listen to the loud, angry voices because they're just caring loudly, right? Um, it means all of these things that, um, that are often challenging when you have a tight time frame within the old worldview that you have to meet to put food on your table. Um, so that is, that is part of the challenge of, of which we can bring our innovation to. Uh, we've exchanged a few thoughts about um, an inspiration, shared inspiration, uh, both reading in the month of December, uh, David Graeber and David Wingrow's uh, The Dawn of Everything. And he, they talk about that, my absolutely <laughs> mind blown. And I'm sure many people on this call have also been reading it or plan to read it very soon. Uh, I know Jay, who's here, we were exchanging some notes about that. Um, we, uh, the, one of the things that I remember in the book that they talk about is they thought the question that they were going in with was, why is it that we have such dramatic social inequality? And they said, that's not really the, and it turns out that's actually the wrong question. The real question is, how do we get stuck? Um, and so they are really questioning um, both our, the social conditions that we currently live in. I mean, one of the quotes is they talk about that um, as our populations get larger in cities, the scale of our social relationships become smaller and smaller, which is the antithesis of what we would think social, from a social conditioning and relationality um, process needs to happen. And then they also talked about um, there was a quote that I pulled from the book, which was the ultimate question of human history is we'll see is not our equal access to material resources, land, calories, means of production, much though these things are obviously important, but it is rather our equal capacity to contribute to decisions about how we live together. And so I'm, I, I'm really curious about how, and especially because you live in, I, it seems like one of the cities that is going through this transformation through Regen, uh, Regen Melbourne and their work with the with Kate Rawers, um, Donut mm -hmm. Economics and the Donut Action <laughs> Lab. Um, I'm really curious how you see these social conditions um, shifting and how this um, certain communities enable that to happen from the from the, um, whether it's in the built structures, it's the civic participation, what are you experiencing in terms of how the social condition is shifting that is enabling um, regenerative, the regenerative cities movement? So it's, it's, it's interesting and I, I want to be quite brief here so that we can hear from everyone else um, because this isn't, um, this is a co-created um, experience. Um, I, that book did blow my mind and, and you know, who knew the French Revolution could have been initiated by Indigenous wisdoms from North American Indians? Um, kaboom! Uh, anyway, I'm di I digress. Uh, what really is interesting is that uh, if we think about the city in a linear way, then it makes sense that the bigger the city, the smaller our networks, because that's how we cope, because we, we, it, we need to be like this to protect ourselves from the complexity out there. If we instead look at it as a, a living systems point of view, as a system of fractals, um, what we need to do is bring in a system of governance, which exactly that quote speaks to, where everyone feels empowered to have a, a voice within the big system because they are part of a, a, a home within a street, within a community, within a, a so so forth and that through that they feel that they have agency um so that is my very brief answer to that and that's um the problem is because we're trying to manage our 
communities and relationships in a linear way as opposed to, you know, a, a fractal um, emotionally intelligent building that capacity within ourselves um, to to have agency uh, within our home, our street, our community, and so forth. Um, not saying that that's easy, but that that's part of the the social conditioning is is that capacity to to step up and and to feel the rights and the responsibilities that come with that. Which here in Australia we we talk about you know responsibilities to country with a capital C. Um, how, how are we an integral part of enabling the thriving of my home, my street, my community, my city, my country, my planet? Um, can you speak a little bit either from the perspective working with the city of Melbourne or as you've been involved with um, the region Melbourne movement, uh, what you've experienced uh, in the in that transition over the past couple of years as that movement has kind of taken taken um, flight. So one of the key things, um, and Kate's works brilliant in Regen Melbourne have done a wonderful um, job in in saying, well, what does this mean for Melbourne? Um, and uh, it goes back to one of the earlier questions of, uh, you know, every place is unique. And so um, we took Kate's Donut Economics and we mashed it and we, uh, we collaborated uh, across um, 2020. And um, we brought in culture and arts and in Indigenous aspects to the Donut as critical social infrastructure of Melbourne. Uh, so that, that's part of it. What, what does it mean for here and how, how does it help surface the personality of this place? And, and it actually goes through one of the critical things of being able to be regenerative in city, cities is to be able to understand the pattern of place um, and, and the pattern of this Melbourne, even pre-colonialisation, was one of um, reaching consensus and, and discussions and, and sort of intellectual endeavour. So Melbourne was a place of intellectual endeavour before white man ever came here. So um, of, of, of thinking of challenging, it's one of the first, uh, the first place in, Mel in Australia where they tried to have a treaty and tried to have those discussions with, with the colonials around how to share care for country. Um, so I, I'd say bringing all of those in. Um, how does it, very pragmatically, um, I, I've just started in my role uh, and that's part of what I'm going to try and do at the City of Melbourne, but it is shifting the whole building industry from a transactional way of working where, you know, you win 20% of your work, so somehow you have to make 80% of your income out of that 20% and, and the whole inefficiencies around that to a more relational long-term way of, of, of working with the industry, of working together for the City of Melbourne. That's the journey I see my role being over the next 15 years at the City of Melbourne. Um, I'm three months in, so I might be very naive in that, but it is that, that intentional shift from the transactional to the relational to enable agency responsibility um, for, for this place. Thanks, and we um, that's encouraging to hear. And I think we're hearing that a lot, even in the procure levels of procurement about how procurement is being reconceived around relationality instead of transactions um, from city governments to even the way corporations are thinking about it. I do want to open up the floor now, if you're okay with that, to others to either share back from, um, uh, from your breakout groups and what was resonating, or if you have specific questions, a question that you'd like to bring into the space, uh, we'll open the floor now to everyone to, uh, to be able to share. Well, like well, to go first? Well, well, people are, uh, are getting their juices ready. Um, I did wanted to share from a couple of people um, on the LinkedIn. So um, the wonderful Frith Walker said that what we need to bring to our cities is love, courage and optimism. Um, and I think that's part of uh, very important within this conversation. Um, Jerome Paddington brought in um, that it's really important to have that honest dialogue, that partner dialogue, not just with each other, um, but also with, with country. Um, and um, Dimity, who's here with us, um, uh, talked about the importance of, of uh, creating cities that enable everyone to 
to to to be themselves, to be their best selves, um, to reach their potential, but also um, to create ecosystems within in our cities that enable biodiversity to reach its potential. So I do thank all of those contributions. I'll, I'll jump in. We had a, um, I'm sort of stealing, I want to steal from Josie. I really feel like Josie should be the one saying this, but um, we sort of talked about uh, the willingness to activate. I, I talked about affinity to trees and, you know, trees are being cut down or falling down and like, you know, what can I do in my area to help, you know, protect that. And then we got into, um, I guess, activation and looking from the individual to those that you can inspire to influence or activators, those who like Adam and May um, and Dominic, you, you who on a bigger level inspire people and, and how um, like just we didn't figure it out, but how do you, you know, how do you get that? How do you get that working? How do, how do you get that sort of, um, and I guess this is all part of it. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Um, particularly because the reading we're doing right at the end speaks very much to this. Um, I don't know if you know the hummingbird story um, and I don't want to take up time, but look up the hummingbird story um, and um, uh, that, that helps with that and that's really about um, do what you can within the areas that you can influence um, but also within regenerative development you always see the potential is up here but your project might only get to here but it's still much further than it would have if you hadn't have seen that potential and so it is that so for every 10 conversations that I have maybe one of them will resonate uh, immediately and a few others in 10 years time someone will call me and say you know that thing you said you know really I now understand and I've moved on so it, it is that letting go of the expectation of success it's it's that um, turning up doing what you can within the sphere of your influence uh, but yes look up the hummingbird story I will for sure it's a Peruvian parable thank you hi Dominique it's Jay Wetter here. Thanks for all your contributions in the chat, Jay. Oh, yeah. It's hard no, not to get that, distracted. <laughs> I wanted to follow up on one of those contributions, actually, which I think is really cool. So I, I'm actually a journalist in agriculture, and uh, and one of the big big issues in, in agriculture is looking towards sustainability, but also um, talking about some of the good advancements that that agri agriculture in Canada has actually done, and helping the citizens of cities. To, to understand agriculture, and 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 I don't I don't want to dwell on that because that's not what this is all about. But what I but one thing that's really important for me from from your conversations about the paddock project is this. I wrote my notes say that you said uh, listening with citizens, which is I don't know whether it was just me not writing properly or whether you actually said that. But I, I think that's really interesting, and I wouldn't mind you commenting on on the use of the word with instead of listening to and whether that was a, a, a something you said on purpose? Uh, could the answer be yes or no? Um, I, I, it wasn't a conscious choice of a word, but it is an intention of how I live my life, which is um, listening isn't just the words, it's, it's, it's in context of uh, the energy of the space, which is where Zoom is, I find so difficult that I can't be in a space feeling that energy. So if, if you listen to Tyson's talk from a few weeks ago, um, you can smell smoke through Zoom. Um, <laughs> but yes, so I think it was intentional in how I am as opposed to intentional as the thought of the word. Um, <clears throat> and it is, it is about that turning up and, and, and listening to the context, not just the words. Um, so as I said, you know, if, if I'm in a meeting and somebody's very aggressive and angry, um, as much as I need to protect the people in the meeting from, from not being affected by the anger, I just see it as caring loudly. Um, there is a lot of energy there and it's a matter of, 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 of being able to work with that as you would with any potential. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
I am. I, I, I did do some work on, on regenerative agriculture and a little bit of a critique of that because um, one of the, the greatest things which I haven't shared with you all about regenerative development is that it's not about the stuff. It's actually not about the city. It's not about the buildings, the artifacts, the streets, the parks. It's the potential we create, the social, the, the non-physical stuff. Um, and one of the things with regenerative agriculture, it's all about how do we improve the quality of the soil, bring more carbon into it, how do we hold on to more moisture, how do we capture the sunlight better, how do we um, create uh, effective yields that enable um, uh, ongoing sustainability of the soil and the ecological systems. But it's not about the heart, the head, the love, the potential of the farmer. Um, and, and, and often that it comes with it, but it isn't something that is designed for. If you look at the regenerative agriculture guides, they tend to be about the, the catching the solar um, diversity, soil, water, carbon and so forth, rather than actually there should be as many dot points about how to enable the potential of the farmer and their families and the communities and, and, and all of that. And, and I think that's one of the things with regenerative cities is it's not about the stuff. It is about the people that inhabit the stuff and how they can be part of this journey. Um, I, uh, I thought I'd take the cue from, there was a mention of the dawn of everything. Uh, one work of Graeber's that uh, struck me quite strongly was his earlier essay, The Phenomenon of Bullshit Jobs. Um, which I don't know whether people are familiar with, but this idea that we essentially feel in our society the necessity to create jobs for people to do. Um, and uh, in doing so, that we actually remove agency in many instances as well from people. And I was kind of struck by this a little bit in terms of the context of cities, your earlier question as to why are people in cities? Um, and uh, one of the reasons for that, of course, is employment. People move to city for employment. We have an issue here, as many places do, in terms of housing affordability um, and commentary on that, that people could move to the country, but of course there aren't the jobs in the country. So we can't, we've kind of got to catch 22. I guess the question I'd be interested in your reflection on is, to what extent, in terms of having the regenerative conversation, do we really need to sort of um, at least highlight or rather necessary challenge perhaps some of these concepts like um, the need for a job which to a certain extent are themselves somewhat degenerative and potentially constraining in potential everyone feel, feels an amazing futurist from new zealand uh, <clears throat> um, so it's interesting when when Adam did the introduction and said, you know, uh, our cities will will grow, uh, are predicted to grow. I'm like, that's such a linear way of thinking. I actually think our cities will stabilise and and will will actually uh, breathe. And and the the book, The Dawn of Everything, talks about how Indigenous people had different ways of. Of, of managing themselves, they would be democratic when they were when it was harvest time and they were in cities, and then they would be authoritarian if they were out hunting. Um, and so we we have this fixed idea of what things are, and I, and I think we have a lot of infrastructure invested in our cities, a lot of embodied energy. So I, I, I'd hate to see them degrade, um, but I also think if we're speaking about a social system that um, it, it will change and it's not necessarily an onward growing because we can do many of our jobs now from the city, uh, from the country. Um, but it is a thinking about what we need to do in the cities, which, which is that social bringing together of, of building of ideas, of sharing of energy, of co-creation. Um, and so I think the roles of cities will change and, and that's possibly uh, another few weeks worth of conversation to explore that. Um, I know there was a second aspect to your question, but I'm, I'm getting to the end of my, my words. My nouns are running out. Um, <laughs> that um, I, I think things will change and the expectation that will always grow um, is, is based on a linear thinking rather than ecological thinking. And, and that what we need to do is design for um, social regenerative development within our cities as opposed to physical um, regenerative development. Um, there was more I wanted to say to that. Oh, bullshit jobs. Yes. Yes, that's what. Um, 
so and then and that's part of that shifting of that transactional to the relational part of of uh, you know if if 20 percent of your one work needs to cover 80 percent of your costs somehow uh, it means that you end up creating lots of reports where you pad them out with lots of other reports that you've done previously just to make them look worth 80 percent more than they actually are um, and that busy work is, is is takes your heart's energy um, and so shifting from that transactional way of, of relating in your work to that to that relational um, is part of this journey. And it's not a quick one, but it is, you know, one of the things I often say before I quit my job at Melbourne Uni was that every year instead of a pay rise, I would take a time cut. So after, you know, 15 years, I was earning the same amount, but I was working three, only three days instead of five days. And, and the amount of freedom that that gives you to just think differently around that. How much money do I actually need to, to thrive? And what else do I want to do with my time? Yes, bullshit jobs. Excuse Thanks, our Holly. French. <laughs> Thank you for those contributions, uh, Phil, and everyone that added in, Dominique, your, uh, your responses. That was uh, that was really great. I'll just since we're on the Graver um, kick, I'll just add one more piece around imagination before you share your reading, which is what if the sorts of people we like to imagine as simple and innocent or free of rulers, governments, bureaucracy, ruling classes and the like, not because they are lacking in imagination, but because they're actually more imaginative than we are which I thought was a beautiful summation point of a lot of his uh, it crosses a bunch of his actually uh, books. Yeah, so, but again, um, it's it's not an either or, right? It's it's not a let's uh, down with the monarchy. It's it's yeah, just yeah. like you know, there there are there are reasons these systems have evolved and these systems have a purpose. But it, it's not just their only purpose. We don't just have a monarchy, or we don't just have a dictatorship, or we don't just have a a a, a place of creativity and and everyone turning up because you know, the world is a changing place. And that's part of the living systems. It's always changing. And we need to have the tools to respond to that change and not be dogmatic about it's this, it's this, it's this. Yes. So he does, he does sneak in, in the bit of the linear thinking sometimes. It's like, it's not an either or. It's yeah, a yes I appreciate and. you bringing that back to the living systems perspective and the, um, the constant, the way that living systems are constantly being reconfigured. And I think that that is the, the overall message is um, how do we how do we enable our cities and social systems to be able to consistently reassess and remodel ourselves based on what is most desirable as a response to that current condition instead of being fixed and entrenched in one way in one path. And certainly and it's a challenge for our it's a challenge for our cities because we have invested so much embodied stuff in our cities. So as yes. as we and it's it's part of the interesting future conversations we could have. Absolutely. Um yes, and of course this is gonna always be too short to cover everything that we would ever want to talk about, but we will we do want to respect uh time. So Dominique uh is going to share a reading from uh from designing for hope that resonated with both may and myself and so we asked her if she wouldn't mind sharing a passage that had inspired us um and and this build, builds beautifully on, on one of the previous questions sorry my dogs decided to uh, come and sit by my feet so she she approves with the reading i think one of the questions our students often ask and this is krishna Duplessis and i uh the authors of the book the problems we face are so big, how can I possibly make a difference? We answer them by referring to three interdependent principles. The first principle is to work with what is in your sphere of influence. Taking inspiration from German poet Rilke's observation that I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. While you only have the power to directly change <clears throat> that which is within your sphere of influence, it's like dropping a pebble in a pond and it ripples and the ripples of your actions can spread far and wide, inspiring others so as to change their behaviour and contribute to the creation of life enhancing, uh, life enhancing world. Um, and uh, the second principle draws on the butterfly effect, which proposes that a small action can build up enough momentum to affect the behaviour of the larger systems. The third principle is that the world we live in is constantly being created, not by governments or by big organisations, 
but by individual actions of people and other organisms, agents, and their responses and actions to changes to, in the environment. This is a foundational principle of the ecological worldview. As these agents respond and adapt to what is happening around them, they can spread the ideas and new behaviours through the system, or they can cause the system to self-organise to create collective behaviours, such as swarming of bees, uh, or the way the school of a ship uh, fish uh, shapes, uh, depending on what's going on around them. They can also create new structures or order out of seemingly chaotic behaviour of complex systems, such as ant colonies or economic systems. Though we may feel as if we are working alone, there is a vast community out there of individuals and small groups who are struggling with the same thing and finding creative and inspiring ways to express the values of the ecological worldview in their personal and professional lives. Finding them and connecting into the web is but a mouse click away. Knowing that they are there is what gives us hope that the world we dream about is not only possible, but is emerging. Um, so uh, that, that is very much around um, that idea of continue to have conversations, continue to dream, um, don't expect results. It's just about a sharing of your potential and the potential that you see and, and, and enabling other people to feel agency in doing that. It's, it's the little drop in the bucket that will, will ripple out and in 10 years time someone might say, hey, remember that thing you said? Um, the question about the reading, uh, um, it comes from a book from 2004, I don't know if it's backwards for you, it looks backwards for me, um, called Designing for Hope. Um, it's a, a very pragmatic book of um, how to get to regenerative development that um, connects about 52 different case studies um, and how they've brought in different ideas of capacity building, um, written with um, Professor Krishna Duplessis. Thank you, Dominique. That was a beautiful conversation, and uh, we appreciate you giving all of your time and all. And I've loved and learned learning from you in the lead up to this conversation, as well as today. Um, we do put these on it's solvable uh, as a kind of com as a community contribution. We don't ask people for uh, money in exchange for this. This is absolutely intended as a commons and very grateful to the speakers who also show up to contribute to that commons. We do have one ask for you per the ripples comment that Dominique is, is uh, alluding to, which is please invite a few others, whether that's to a recording of this conversation, which we will be sharing with you in the next couple of days or the upcoming conversations. What uh, the best thing that we could um, have come out of these is the ripple effects for more people engaging more deeply with each other in conversations about our regenerative future. And with that, we want to say thank you to everybody for your contributions today, for um, showing up fully and joining us. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully on January 20th on, for the conversation on regenerative agriculture with Nicole Masters. Thank you again, Dominique, and thank you, May, for co-hosting. And uh, be well, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>